All right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, I hope you're blessed wherever, wherever you are in the world. It's so nice to see everyone, as it always is. Um, what a wonderful blessing it is to come together as a community, uh, as a wider community on Shabbat, and so wonderful to see everyone. Um, for those that uh, might just be watching the video, um, come and join us if you're led and uh, be a part of the live gathering. We'd love to see you. And uh, if you're led to do so, just go to River Shabbat website and uh, you'll be able to scroll down there on the home page it says welcome to the river just hit that subscribe and uh, put in a first and last name and an email address and uh, that'll put you on our community uh, newsletter list and that newsletter every week goes out and it includes the live link to that coming shabbat's live gathering which is 11 uh, a.m pacific standard time for wherever you might be in the world and we'd love to see you all right, we uh, we've got way forward here in this heart of the discipleship series, um, and again, uh, you know, it tends to be more for the community um, that's you know actually walking together and doing things, and so we're speaking in those terms. Um, and for those who aren't a part of the community and uh, and don't walk uh, walk you know sort of with others in it and whatnot, and maybe just watch a video or things like that. Um, the real thing that we're going through here and the encouragement we're going through is, you know, how do we, how do we walk together as his people in a way that's pleasing to him? And so that's what we're trying to, to figure out and to do. And as a part of that, we sort of uh, work together as a, uh, as a group of uh, ministry and servant leaders and, and, uh, and those who sort of serve into the wider community and, uh, those who walk as a community to sort of figure this out. And we affectionately have over uh, the series have given this uh, affectionate term of the river village and things like that. Um, but really what it is, is that he's, we're trying to learn how to operate as one body. And that's, that's, that's not as easy sometimes as it sounds, you know, you read that in scripture and, you know, so, you know, and then you kind of look at the state of things and, you know, Judaism and Christianity and, you know, Messianic movements and Hebrew roots. And you just kind of look at it all. You just think, wow, you know, um, we just we, we just really need to learn how to get over ourselves and get back to a simple and uh, honorable biblical faith. And so that's a great challenge uh, in these modern times as we come to the end of the age, because uh, there's just so much noise going on around us um, as well as in the house. And so. Things like what we are doing here in this series and whatnot is really about, okay, well, what's going on in our own house to really just kind of consider our way. You know, we, we don't use a standard of self-righteous judgment on an unbelieving world as a way to make ourselves feel better and look at me and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the world is struggling at this time and, uh, you know, we're all amongst it. We're in it, um, but we're not of it. And so what does that mean? And, and really the word encourages us to look at ourselves. Um, to not be caught up in these, you know, as we sit in the series to, you know, the political uh, paradigms and things, but we're to have a biblical faith. And so, and sometimes it's hard not to, because we have a world out there and all of us participate in eat from the tree of good and evil. We were born into that, but what the father is steering us to is a part of his great plan of redemption and what messiah has done by bringing us a chance to come back into his house and be a part of his people is that we will start to eat of the tree of life but all of us have been participating in good and evil uh things as it relates to his standard of righteousness and we were simply born into that and but some of us of the faith are waking up and realizing there is another way and it's his way and we're supposed to come into the house, um, not try and fix that which is outside the house. And this is a very difficult challenge at times in our faith walk because we see stuff going on in the world around us and we want to try and do something, you know, and, you know, even try to say, you know, people, there's a better way or that's not acceptable or, you know, can you not see that that's evil? Um, and that is a difficult challenge because we're not going to fix this if we're honest with the word. Um, he does. He he allows what he allows. He decides when uh, when we will come to the end of the age and when he's had enough uh, of what's going on. And then and in the meantime, while we're in this place of uh, being here right now, we're we're to figure out how it is that we can be pleasing in his sight, that we may be a witness of him, um, because, you know, as we come to the end of the age, 
uh, he's got a great plan and, uh, and he will be sorting out this mess. And so for those of the, uh, of the faith, we know this, we believe this, we understand this to be true. And so, uh, really, what does that mean until, uh, this comes? And as of course we see this all unfolding in the world around us, we know that the time is, uh, getting short and this runway of, uh, tolerance from our creator is, uh, is going to come to an end and we will see the fulfillment of the fall appointed times. And, um, and so there's instructions for us to uh, look at our own house, to look up our redemption draweth nigh, to uh, let the righteous be righteous, let the filthy be filthy, these sorts of things as we come to the end of this age to sort of go, okay, what does this mean for us? And so this heart of discipleship is about us really discussing our house um, and, and what we can do and how we can do this better. Now, this way forward here is a quote by Henry Ford. He says, if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. Now, uh, you know, Henry Ford is the, the great, obviously famed American industrialist and business magnate, the, you know, the founder of the Ford Motor Company and everything else. And what was behind this success in moving forward, his way of moving forward was a mass production assembly line. And you look at this and I say, okay, well, I see the truth in that statement, but then how did he go about it? And it was about creating a mass production assembly line. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's not the father's way. So it is true that he wants us moving forward. He doesn't want us looking back. He doesn't want us, you know, in spiritual context, turning into a pillar of salt. He doesn't want us returning to our vomit and things like that. He wants us moving forward. And I, then I do believe then his uh, plan in our lives, his will for our lives, and and uh, his great plan of redemption does move forward according to his will. But he's not doing it in a mass assembly production line. This is a lot of what religion has done. And uh, I want to encourage people that, you know, his way is actually a way of connecting and communicating and to work through a matter and to test whether these things be so that nothing should be down to a single ministry or individual or teaching or whatever it is that we've done, that we're actually to go through this process. Now we can respect the, the you know, the teachings and things like that. Um, we can enjoy say the, the, the part of the body that we connect with that the father's blessed us or led us to, that's all good. And we should enjoy and respect that and each other. Uh, and those serving into it, as Paul would say, um, the great, you know, you know, the apostle Paul, you know, dealt with this and he was, you know, trying to give an apply, a living application of the Torah and the prophets into a people that were coming back into the house. And we're in a place of repentance. Of course, there was much to deal with at that time. And here we are almost 2000 years later on the other book. And in a game, we're facing these same challenges. So there is a reason for why the father gives to his kahal, you know, a servitude, um, which is Paul expressed it had five components to it, you know, with the, you know, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, the pastors, uh, and so on. And so when you're, when we're doing this, we need to understand that this model is not a production line. And unfortunately, what we saw in a lot of religion is it made it a production line. Just get involved in this denomination or do this and tick these boxes and whatnot. And I see it in every aspect that we see that essentially comes from Mystery Babylon. Line up, toe the line, and, uh, you know, we're all going to do this. But what if it isn't including his ways or his truth and things like that? How do we go about doing this? And so what he patterned was much more of a participation and a uh, much more natural way of the human design to work out um, our fallen state and this disease of self, which we all have. And uh, self brings a lot to the party, which um, creates a lot of noise in our life. Anybody here created noise in your life because of your choices? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we got lots of honest people in this community. You know, we're a weird community that way because, you know, we say things and do things that really should be offensive to uh, to a lot of people that uh, have pride still ruling their lives. And yet we're able to have enough people gathering now who are getting over themselves and realizing that we fall short. Oh, indeed, we fall short. And uh, yet he loves us. And he's doing something here now that is quite great. And, uh, and so we've discovered that our faith is 
uh, is uh, given to us. It's established. It's understood as a part of his people, which is he calls his great house, the house of Israel. Uh, he gave us his standard of righteousness, his Torah, the prophets uh, uh, gave homage to that, instruction of that, and look forward to the Messiah. And then, of course, we live this time of testament of all of this being true and coming to be. And this is why we have something called the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the majority of it and those who served in it in the account is actually application. It's about taking the foundation of our faith and go, okay, how do we apply this in a living, healthy way? And so if you throw out that testament and what the father gave to us, if you don't understand what Yeshua came to do and model and pattern, what the apostle Paul was doing, what the disciples were doing, if you don't get why we have something called the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah, that it was actually giving us a way of understanding that we're coming back into the house and how do we apply this? Because we have a standard of righteousness and truth for which we fall short of. And yet, yeah, is not going to change his ways and his standards and his design and his truth. We just fall short of it. And then we have to, you know, go. And so he took responsibility to that. I believe the ultimate responsibility, accountability and consequence. And our Elohim came down to show us how to do it. And we killed him for it. Isn't that nice? <laughs> he takes that ultimate accountable, you know, position and responsible position. And uh, he wore the consequence of it. His own creation was going to take him out. And it was going to be that part of his creation that actually believed in him. And that's sobering. And so, you know, um, we don't have a great track record. Okay. I'm just putting it that way. You know, don't worry. This isn't a condemnation thing. It's just more, you know, we don't really have a lot to stand on. If we look in the scheme of the time domain and the great plan of redemption, we make a mess of everything, you know, because we're trying to work out, uh, we're trying to work out our salvation his plan of redemption. And, uh, and so as doing so, we struggle with a lot of things. Uh, along the way. In Proverbs eleven fourteen, we sort of finished off with this last week. It says, where there is no guidance, a people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is safety. This great wisdom that is sitting here is very, very true. And I'm going to suggest to you, as we get to the teaching today, that Yeshua himself is going to operate the age to come in, my, in the same way. And if, the, if, if our Elohim is going to honor this wisdom. Who are we to not? And we have to really think about this serious. This is a very serious proverb. Because it means it. And then often, and I know in my life, and maybe in many of yours life, we got into trouble because there wasn't an abundance of counselors in our lives. <laughs> we were having to make decisions on our own for ourselves, by ourselves. We might've done that from a prideful position or a self-righteous position, or maybe we just didn't have anybody to walk with. But whatever the case may be, often the trouble in our lives comes because we actually don't have the input from others. And that input provides a wisdom to make better decisions, better choices. And that's really what this is about. And then, of course, we got all the challenges that come with that, you know, whether we're married, but we're not in a, an ideal marriage situation, we're in an ideal marriage situation, we might be single, we might be divorced, we might be widowed, whatever it is, and we've got this challenge. How do we find wisdom? She's precious. And how do we find it, given all the various scenarios we can find ourselves in this broken world? Proverbs is going to say, without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. We, we do a journey as a wider community to, you know, try to strive to be pleasing in his, in his eyes. But then we can all go about that doing it our own way because we always think we know better, um, you know, in and of ourselves. And um, it's partly the disease we have um, as to why that is. And so it's a challenge. But if we can get to that place where we go, okay, this is what we're doing as a community. This is, you know, some of the things that we believe in the, uh, you know, we're applying the great truths of our, of our faith and we're trying to apply it in a living way. And we have all this modern expression of it, but the principles uh, and the patterns 
aren't changing. We're just experiencing this modern expression of it. So without uh, uh, direction and an ability to go forward, which he's given us, you know, and then the advisors, um, then we can find ourselves in trouble. So we need to glean wisdom at every corner, at every turn in what we do. So we choose to do this as a community as best we can, that we do not operate unto uh, islands uh, unto ourselves. And there's actually warning in scriptures that we are not to forsake the gathering of coming together, as is the habit of some. And this was talked about almost 2000 years ago in the early Kahal. They actually don't gather because, you know, well, I know better or this person offends me or that's not what I believe or whatever else is going on. And because of that, they separate themselves and they don't actually go on the journey. And so this can bring in a little bit of trouble. And we spoke about last week how this um, creates this environment of Lashon Hara. And Lashon Hara is just not about, you know, deception or lying and things. It can be. Um, but in most cases, it's I, most Lashon Hara I've seen comes with good intention. Um, and we end up uh, with our own agendas and our own spin, trying to do the right thing, you know, or saying something or not saying something. And the real issue around Lashon Hara is you can engage in Lashon Hara by saying nothing as well. And, and so we need to understand that this whole thing is based around the intent. It's ultimately a matter of heart. It's why you're saying or not saying something. And has that become evil, the tongue, or the tongue that is evil? Do we steer something in a way and we guise it under religious doctrine or what I know or what I think and all this kind of stuff, you know, or, you know, I've got to say something because, you know, and it's like, no, it's not about saying something or not saying something. It's about why. Why are you saying it at all? And, and when you have a desperately wicked heart, which we all do, that needs heart circumcision, it behooves us at every level, whatever we're doing, whatever service from counsel to teaching to whatever it is to for us to to really check, you know, why do we do what we do? Why are we serving another giving counsel? Why am I, you know, um, uh, giving a teaching on Shabbat? Why are we going to help this person? That, you know, like, what is it about um, a lot of servitude that goes on? Within a believing body, unfortunately, people are serving because they're actually serving their own self-worth. And it's not, they're not actually serving with the right heart even. And so can you serve with the wrong? Yes, you know, and all this kind of thing. So, you know, we're in, we're in quite a conundrum here, <laughs> you know, um, it's a work this all out. And so the important thing that, that we, when we finished off last week, uh, I gave a message on ambassadorship. And I really want to reinforce this, that this is an area for us as a community to understand that when we are saying things, when we are working with others, when we are trying to interact as a body, it is about why we are. And sometimes there's a need for correction and reproof and edification, and they all play their part. But we have to really check ourselves. And what the scripture is saying is, is that counsel in our lives reduces the Shon Hara. Healthy counsel operating actually reduces our ability to put forth the evil tongue. And so, and we want that because, you know, like I say, we're, 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 we're still a work in progress. We're not done till he says it's done. And so, you know, we all got to be conscious of this and wherever we're called to serve as best we can. This donkey quote here, this never walk alone. Don't, when we talked about this right at the beginning of the heart of discipleship series and, it's, and uh, it says don't ask what your village can do for you but what you can do for your village you see this affectionate term that we have for trying to walk together as a wider community and different ministries and things like that is really about if we can see ourselves as one body which was the beginning of the series we can start to then take seriously uh, how we act with each other and then of course to the outside world and one of the things that that starts to change when we when we get a true understanding of this is his body, not ours, and he is head of it, not us, that we start to go, okay, what can I do? What can I do for you, my king? And then he turns our head spiritually towards each other and says, this is what you can do. You can love what I love. You can care about what I care about. And this becomes a very 
Very interesting journey. So it leads us into this realm where we've talked about in the past of responsibility, accountability, and consequence. We all have this inside our faith. And we need to own our walk in that sense. We need to take responsibility in that sense, each and every one of us, because we we are in a place where we have a righteous judge, essentially. Now, responsibility is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. doesn't matter what, you know, the world's trying to throw out responsibility, accountability, and consequence right now. And we see that happening. And as a result, we're seeing, we're seeing society crumble. It's trying to do this without having people be responsible, accountable, and bring consequence. And so what that's doing is it's, it's killing us. But these things aren't bad things. Responsibility is a good thing, providing we have accounts, providing we have input, providing we're not trying to be alone. Accountability lets us understand what that means in that given moment or what it is or what we're doing. And of course, consequence is not a bad word. There's good consequence. If we get this in a healthy way, consequence, the consequence of this can be good fruit. You know, often when we hear the word consequence, we think of it as a negative connotation, don't we? Right. It's just not, that's what happens in the Western sense, but it's not. Consequences is not a negative thing or a positive thing. It just is. And it's either going to be good fruit or bad fruit. That's all. Okay. So we come into this place in the house and we talked about the community and sort of looking at this and going, okay, well, in the wider community, we have the men, the women, the children, and we sort of looked at these various things and where this goes. And so moving forward now, there's a responsibility in our servitude and, and how we look at this um, at each of our levels. When you are helping another brother or sister and sharing in their burden, thus fulfilling the law of Messiah, when we are doing these things, um, we are in a servant role. And so all of us have responsibility in the house of our community, in our own actions, our behavior. And it doesn't matter how good our intent is. Why are we doing what we're doing? What is truly the heart behind it? Is it pride? Is it self-worth? Is it insecurity? Is it truly the health of others in their spiritual journey? And that's a sobering thing to be honest about. Especially if, you know, you're, you're trying to share uh, messages and, and, and teach in the body. I'm always having to try and double check that. But also uh, any form of servitude at the family level, husband to wife, to the children, to brothers, sisters. Every, we, we need to be checking this. Because a true discipleship-based community that is going to have a health, healthy environment is going to have to check self at the door. Now, we may not always be successful at that. So that's why we need help. That's why we need this council. That's why we have this thing. And, um, but as we do that, we want to make sure that we do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a real way. And so we don't want to get into some controlling environment where you've got some mothership just administering it's Nicolaitan or it's, you know, and we, and we don't want to get into some culty type environment where it's all coming down to one person or teaching or booklets or whatever's going on. We have to allow that, um, that we take the principles given to us and apply those principles as best as we can today. Well, we've got things like Zoom here, and we, you know, we got websites and things, you know, the ancient Kahal did not have this, the ancient churches, people did not have this almost 2000 years ago. But that doesn't mean that we, we don't and are, aren't responsible and accountable and will have the consequence of applying those ancient pattern and principles. He hasn't abandoned that. And it doesn't matter how the modern expression plays out. It doesn't matter how the modern culture is trying to change the creator's design and all these sorts of things. We're responsible for being in his house. And so the discussion needs to be around that so that we're healthy. So people don't get caught up in often unhealthy and even toxic faith environments. So. Um, for those of us in the community, we have this platform, you know, the donkey stable. And as a part of that, um, we uh, have, um, and, I want, and I want you to go and look at that, is a a group of ministry, servant leaders, people serving in the body that walk with one another to give this counsel of many. Um, 
And within that, and I serve on on the eldership within this discipleship environment, as do some of the other uh, servant leaders and things in other ministries. And what it is, is a part of keeping accountable, feeding in, getting counsel, getting wisdom. And we spoke about that earlier uh, in this series. And of course, uh, those that saw the um, In the Trenches series heard from some of the other eldership. And what it is, is we take this seriously. It's eldership. There is no one single voice. There is no, you know, well, you know, um, you know, people overriding and usurping and whatnot. These are actually separate and different ministries coming together and choosing to know that what the scripture is saying as a body and the counsel that's needed is actually real. We believe those words. I need input and counsel in my life, as do the others who are serving at the ministry level in these in this community. Here's the good news, I believe, for everyone. You have that in this wider community. You actually have people that are taking that seriously. Nobody thinks, you know, they're the man or the woman or we've got it all or every answer. It's, it's not what's going on here. But it's so foreign to both the religious and secular environments these days because everything is based on, you know, just coming down to programs or movements or politics or whatever it is. And it just gets also real culty. And, you know, it's like, you know, you're catching ourselves, you know, to, to these things. And it's like, where is the council that's coming in? that's based on responsibility, accountability, and consequence. And so go and look at that. We've tweaked this a bit and this will be a work in progress and we'll add and, and, and continue to develop it. But we've sort of updated this and whatnot to kind of give a reflection of what we do as a wider community, because this is the one place that kind of binds us all. We all agree that we need to have some discipleship and input into our lives. And the question then is, is how do we do that in a healthy way? And so this platform represents that. It is no single platform that is um, uh, controlled by any single person or ministry in it. It's kind of our community platform. We just relate it to the analogy of the donkey given to us in scripture because it's servitude based. And so go and look at that. Read through what it actually says on that homepage. Read it. Okay. Because it's, it's ours. It's not mine, not Michael's, not Shane's or any of the other leaders. It's, it's ours. And so what we do is we incorporate the eldership principle that it may be as healthy as possible while we're all working out our rubbish. <laughs> and while we're all dealing with the state we're in. Um, but we're seeing and have seen so much good fruit in people's lives that, um, that it is actually, it's incredible to be a part of. Uh, I've never personally lived this in my whole faith journey. Um, and now we're living it and we're seeing the work the father is doing in people's lives. No matter what their relational statuses are and things, whatnot, we're actually seeing it's not us or some teaching or some individual. We're actually seeing something go on that is beyond any single person or ministry or teaching or whatever it is, that to me is the fingerprint of the Ruach. It's real. Something real is actually happening here and we're seeing good fruit as a result. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have noise and working through issues and everyone has their time of vomiting and <laughs> all this kind of stuff as we work things out. It's not about being perfect. It's about that over the long term, those that are actually getting this are actually starting to fundamentally see good things healthier things happen as a part of their faith journey. And so that's what this is all about. As a part of that, um, and this tree of life here that I show, often it's just what it's showing is discipleship in its totality. And there's international fellowship in this outer ring. And this is kind of what we're seeing as a part of our wider community is this international fellowship. And then we have maybe our wider fellowship gatherings, um, like what we're doing now in River Shabbat and things like that. So we have the community, we have the, you know, wider fellowship. Gathering. And then we have these small group fellowship environments, you know, where the men and we call it for the men, we call it stables. And for the women, it will be more organic and natural, as we discussed earlier. But we will meet and we should meet and need to meet in closer fellowship environments. But how do we do that wisely and safely? 
because this is often where the greatest fruit we could possibly see ever come because this is where the living water is delivered to this tree. If I took out the center of this tree, all we have is Shabbat gathering and a wider community made up of and no living water getting to it, no wisdom and counsel of many getting to it, none of this stuff happening. And as a result, we will miss the mark. The, the ancient Hebrew root of Torah derived from Yara, uh, Yara to hit the mark. And Yeshua is the mark. He is what we are aiming for. And so if we don't take the principles he taught us, it's a very, very difficult thing to do this all on our own, wandering around on the internet on that outer ring and expect good fruit from it. It's actually not his way. And by the way, he plans on carrying this into the next age to come. He does. And if there's anyone that didn't need to incorporate all of this, it's him. He's probably the only one that could get away with it. Yet he chooses to do it a certain way. And he's going to choose to do this in the age to come. And he's looking for those, I believe, right now, who are going to respect that who are going to receive the blessing of that and who are going to take seriously that it's not all about me. It's about him. It's not just a glib statement that we say to sound wonderful in our faith. You know, I often used to, you know, hear that, you know, and I don't hear it so much in this community, but I'd often hear this over the years walking, you know, well, it's, it's all about, yeah, it's all about Jesus or it's all about Yeshua, you know, and yet nothing good is going on in their lives. Unwise decisions, no, no work going on in fruit met for repentance and things like that. Yet we're saying all the right things, or we might be gaining knowledge in some area or something and thinking, well, if I just... I just become more knowledgeable, you know, or uh, others might be, well, if I just understand what the devil's doing right now on the earth and I'm good and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, is that really what Yeshua came to pattern? Is this really his ways? Is this really what it's all about? Um, and so it's deeper than that. And so how do we go about this in a healthy way? I've got here walking together here. And I just want to read through some points which are mentioned on the website. I said, you know, many people, and I want to talk to some of these points that are mentioned on it. We like the concept of discipleship in the sense of, you know, because we have a human design that's naturally designed to be a part of a social construct. But to truly understand and appreciate this is really by few, you know, to really understand the long term and lasting benefits and discipleship values of our faith journey. Some of the eldership that you heard to as a part of this wider community that we're in have been men walking with each other now for years some 10 years, a decade, and they've managed to do it and love each other still after 10 years. And actually not only love each other, actually grow closer. Yet we're not seeing this in a lot of community, faith-based communities or denominations or movements. Why? And so at that point where people have to till the ground and get their hands dirty or vomit or get it out is, is the most important time to now be in an environment that can kind of till the soil on this. And so this is an important thing. So this is what we value and what we're trying. Often people are just finding themselves walking their faith journey alone these days. It's not good. And it results really in some things that are not healthy over time. As I said earlier, the wider community is made up of the different ministries. We take that seriously. Um, together with their respective servant leaderships, we choose to volunteer our support and to walk more closely with to help people connect into the biblical faith. We choose to do this. This is not some subscription based thing. It's not about, you know, some booklet. It's not about, you know, telling other ministries how they what they got to do and can't do. It's not about telling people who gather what they can do or not do or who they can listen to or not listen to and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't have what it we're doing is a framework of trying to give the healthiest chance possible for us to till the ground. And the Ruach is going to and is the only one that can actually do the work in our hearts and the only one who can renew our minds. We actually take that seriously. Now, we may, we can always do it better. We'll, we will hopefully will <laughs> learn to do it better. We'll mature. We'll, we'll grow. We're doing the best we can with what he's given us, but he has given us much. And I really want to encourage you. It has been much. 
And although at any given time, we may not agree with the teaching or understand it, or, you know, um, uh, we don't understand why, you know, somebody's doing something this way or whatever it is, at some point you've got to go, okay, but I'm going to investigate why my brothers or sisters see it this way, why a council or an eldership would see it this way, why the word says what it says and not just, you know, um, interpret it. Uh, you know, um, you know, to interpret his word um, in the in, in the sense of a in a prophetic sense, um, and come up with our own interpretations and then apply it to our own unsubmitted life. You know, and I'll just go and learn some more knowledge, and somehow that'll make everything all right. So, it, just to make that very clear, it's not subscription based. It's not based on whether you have to, you know, you know, pay a registration fee to be a part of something and all this kind of stuff. This is truly the, the, the servant leadership choosing to walk together and to volunteer. And it's truly those who want to be a part of this choosing to submit one to one to another. Because without the sovereignty in this picture, we don't have anything. What we have is is a form of, 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 uh, of conformity. And that will never bring unity. Not true unity. We're not here demanding people conform to, you know, to some little doctrinal pamphlet. We have to walk this out. And it's okay. Sometimes people just aren't going to agree or see something a similar way. And you have to walk it out to get to a place. But I promise you this, you walk long enough over time and you get your own behavior in check. You might just find that some of your views grow and mature too. It's not just everyone else. Has anybody here experienced growing and maturing at all in Messiah in the last few years? <laughs> well, may it continue right to the end. Right. May that continue to happen, because if it does, that's only good news. That's what we want. So we affectionately call this the River Village community. But it's not some sort of, you know, it's a way of us to relate to what what's going on here. It's, you know, it's not something in and of itself. It's just our way of relating, you know, to our community and the ministry and the servants and the people walking in it are doing together. You know, so we don't want to now make something else, you know, up, you know, we're, we, we, we have things to be able to relate because we're in this separated human form. But what we don't want to do is reinvent Messiah. So we can relate to things with the river village, you know, donkey stable, things like that. But we try and keep things even in the way we relate to it as biblical as possible so that we don't do that because the human condition is, well, we'll just find another way to do it, master. And what we're trying to do is have a journey to find out what, what was it that he really patterned, you know? And so that's hard. So we inherently have a basic need for wider community and these social connections. It's a part of our human design, but how do we do this in a healthy way to strive, to walk together, to create this opportunity for discipleship? This was all a key part and a major witness of the discipleship pattern by Yeshua when he walked the earth. That's what this was about. How do we apply this? They were all the schooling at the, at the time that Yeshua walked the earth. And those fishermen, they weren't ignorant. Their education from ages, you know, generally, historically, was seven years old to 12 years old. And then you would come of age at 13. They were educated in the Torah and the prophets, mainly the Torah. But this was what it was about. And so that was applied and taught by the parents to the children. The parents might have gone to synagogue and they might have gone through Torah portions, readings and things like that. And then they took that and then they would disseminate that in a wise and healthy way to their children. You know, there's things in the Torah that are what? You know, perfectly fine for a 12 year old to grapple with, but might need the wisdom of a parent if you're seven in these sorts of things. And so we need to respect these these principles, and this is why it was left in the hands of the parents. In De Deuteronomy 6, parents instruct your children in my ways. 
parents do this. And this is why we do what we do in the oral ministry to encourage this. But we won't tell people what to do. We won't tell people how to raise their kids. We don't tell, you know, all that sort of thing. It's like, no, let's get it right in our own house and then watch what will happen. It will be a much healthier environment in the home. Life can be challenging these days. Perhaps you've been hurt in the past, you know, with our faith, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, that often is the things. Um, uh, and sometimes it just be, we just want deeper connections with those we've come to know and trust so that we can explore the, our, you know, our faith in meaningful ways. Um, but we honestly don't believe this can be purely achieved and only through ministry structures, classroom settings, various teachings and wider faith gatherings. There has to be that connection at the level that Yeshua came to pattern. Do you see my point? I'm not disparaging our servitude at the ministry level. You know, what we try to do in that sense, um, you know, the teachings or whatever it is, or learning and wanting to learn more and the joy of actually learning his truth at deeper levels. But we honestly don't believe that Messiah came and spent more time doing anything than I can see Elohim and spend at any time in scripture for no reason. It was where the living waters would come from. And so we've got to have something that allows us to engage at this level, to work out things in our lives at the heart level. And you can't do that on a River Shabbat gathering like this in and of itself. We can't do it with, you know, a teaching, you know, and you listen to a teaching, you know, from a teacher you respect, you know, and suddenly your heart circumcised. <laughs> That's a result. It'd be nice if it worked like that, perhaps. But would it? Would it be legitimate? Would it be a sovereign walk? You see, we serve into these things so that we can get to Messiah. Not to any single person or ministry. That we can get to Messiah. Now, if you respect those who are doing that, that's wonderful. Uphold them, respect them, support them, walk with them, whatever. But we got to get to Messiah. Is everybody hearing me on this? I'm, I'm not meaning to offend anyone, you know, and speak disparagingly on those of us trying to serve. But we must understand that we're not, we're not him. And it's not our house. We serve his house. And we actually have to understand this now. At this time, it's more important than ever. Everyone has a different experience in their related faith journey. These are personal. They need to be valued and respected as we seek out his truth. Don't disparage your own journey and don't disparage others. A lot of us have had to go through making a lot of mistakes or go through some interesting things before we started to realize maybe there's a better way. Okay. Well, there's value to those journeys because people learn a lot when they overcome. And no single person is overcoming all matters of life challenges. I, I haven't met one anyway. But as a body, we could get access to that wisdom. And we're going to talk about this a little bit, especially when it comes to single, divorced, widowed people. We often think, oh, well, you know, they're not servants. Oh, yes, they are. Because a lot of those people have lived and overcome things. And just because they may not be in a marriage relationship doesn't mean that the value of them serving in the body is suddenly not there. In fact, it's necessary. It's just how we do it. Are we doing it in a healthy way? Can we see the difference on that? Can you hear me? Yeah. So are we ready to walk with others, work out our salvation and, you know, if life's inevitable challenges to partake in these in a healthier, loving faith environment? Are we willing and ready to do this? Because all of us need to receive and to give and, and, and the, give the support at various times over the course of our lives. There's times to give. There's times to receive. We all need it. And this is mentally, emotionally, physically, and most importantly, spiritually which is the focus of what we're looking at today. We encourage everyone to be a part of the wider community, to walk closer and to have these connections and to be valued and respected, whether you fully agree or not, or understand certain things, pull and rein ourselves in. Walk with those who the Father's given you. Life is not about ourselves. It's not just about ourselves. Sorry, it is all about ourselves, but it's not just about ourselves. <laughs> Those who journey with us do. Let us help and share in one another's burdens. This is why it was so important and part of Messiah's law. And hopefully as a result of just those basics being incorporated, we actually become a better witness. We don't say I'm going to be a good witness. It's an outcome. <laughs> that is the outcome. 
You know, and that's where I will agree with my Henry Ford quote. If we get this right, the outcome will be a success. But fruit is is the outcome of a process of a healthy tree, of being pruned, being tilled, being, you know, it's not boom, here, here's my fruit. And then we create a whole bunch of whitewashed tombs. What I can say in all of this, as we go forward and, and, and just, just look at this way forward, we will prioritize what we value. And so while we deal with self, we value a lot of different things. Um, you know, don't feel guilty about that. The fact that we're in this fallen state, you didn't decide to be born into it. Your Messiah did. But we are to overcome to a point where we're not always prioritizing ourselves above others. That's the point. We will naturally do that. The issue is, can we get anything else in there? <laughs> and so what do we do the donkey stable, our environment for the community to engage in healthier discipleship at a more closer level. It does not represent or promote any particular religious denomination, movement or political alignment. And therefore, it is not the place or the platform for such activity and related agendas. Don't bring these things. We don't tell people what kind of politics they have to have or, you know, things about their faith journey, everything. Else. What we're saying is don't bring things into this environment, which are not of him for the purpose of being able to actually share in one another's birds and grow that we may need to know him. You know, your politics is your business. Just leave it out. We're not interested. And don't bring those activities and agendas here on social media and arguing with people and saying, like, whoa, you know, if, if, you know, you go live your life as you're going to live your life. All I'm suggesting is you have an Elohim that's saying, Mr. Mrs. You might want to have some counsel. Well, you do that. You might want to have some input and you might want to have some input. That's got some wisdom attached to it. I've got here seeking his truth. Just because we agree with someone else does not always make us right. Often we think that, right? Oh, I agree with somebody, you know, therefore suddenly that's the stamp of being right. Right. Has anybody ever agreed with somebody and you, and realized they, they, you know, you weren't right by agreeing with them. You will have encountered that in your life journey. And just because we disagree with someone doesn't always make us right. That's another thing we do. Oh, I disagree with you. And what's happening inside is I'm right, you're wrong. Whether, you, whether you're trying to consciously do that or not. And so what I'm saying is when you're in, the, we're in these environments, so this is either going to be a recipe of self, we're reading self here right now, of division, or we're going to actually acknowledge this and go, okay, wait a minute. Me agreeing or disagreeing with someone, whatever is going on here it's a part of walking in a faith environment does not make me right. My perspective, my views, my understanding of things. This often trips people up, especially historically and culturally. I see many arguments in the body and, and things like this and over the years and things I've got to work through where somebody will bring something and, and uh, you, you know, they might disagree, say, with a historical perspective on a prophet or with Moshe or with even Yeshua or whatever it is. And suddenly, and that's cultural and historical, and suddenly they're confusing that with his truth. You know, you can disagree or be wanting to know something more from a historical cultural perspective to find out whether that's a truth and that allows us to better understand his truth. But what you don't do is confuse those things. Do you know the amount of arguments and doctrines and traditions I see that aren't actually regarding his truth? They're regarding us trying to get a better understanding of the historical and cultural context of our faith. And so to create division and arguments while we're trying to understand a truth of a matter isn't necessarily disparaging his truth. And this is why we say in the community, what we don't, what we do as a community is and you'll see this, you know, as, as a part of engaging. Look, if you don't believe that our faith was given to us in the Torah and the prophets, then we don't have a foundation. We're standing on a faith. That's not negotiable. Now, how we look at it and understand that that's going to be the journey. But if we can't agree that our creator defines righteousness, <laughs> if we can't agree that he's told us the truth, well, then this is not a community for you. And the same token, if you don't understand, you fall short and you need the blood of Messiah 
and understand that there's a healthy application of this as we go through it in a fallen place. If you don't understand, the blood, then again, you're not, I believe, of a true biblical faith. And so these are things we can't compromise. Messiah's truth, what he said, how he said it, his coming, his blood, his Torah. These are things that aren't negotiable. Now, the historical understanding and context well, there's a journey in behind it. This is what Paul was doing with the early Kahal. And we're going to do the book of Corinthians together as a community um, coming up uh, this year. And one of the things that you'll see is he's not, it's not about the father's truth. Not, his truth is never negotiable. What he's saying is we've got to get an application of this truth in a healthy way. But what a lot of people do is they make their historical understanding of something. Well, you know, they did this 2000 years ago or they did this a thousand years ago or they they do this now. And then they suddenly make that his truth. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's just what was happening historically, you know, and even that can be questionable. And so we have to go on journeys and educate ourselves so that we can get a better understanding of things. Um So we just got to be very, very careful in our search to get context of his truth, that we don't make that search of context an actual argument that it is his truth. His truth and a truth are actually different things. And this causes a lot of division and hurt in the body. And you have to grow spiritually to get past this, to understand this. If somebody says something historically or culturally concerning matters in the, in the word, Don't be offended by that. It may be that you don't have that understanding and getting that understanding then brings a a greater context. And then if that greater context exists, then understanding how to apply his truth comes into play. So we just got to remember his truth is not negotiable. Trying to understand the context and applying it and how that was applied in the past and by those who came before us, that is a journey. And this is why we would even have, that's just why we actually have the New Testament. By the way, we wouldn't even have the Brit Hadashah unless Paul came and Yeshua came and the disciples were there to go, okay, this is how we live it out. The truth didn't change one iota. And the foundation of the faith delivered to the saints once and for all was, had been delivered. Nothing changed. But they're working out how do we take all this truth of our Elohim and now apply it. And I hope you can really understand the difference of this because if not, we'll get into... I agree, disagree space. And a lot of that can be based actually on how we our own little doctrines and traditions and that sort of a thing. Okay, spiritual design of line of sight. And this is the real point of this way forward today here. Now there is a model and it's it's the marriage covenant model that he does. And the reason why he's doing that is that's a great, um, how can I say? Uh, It's a great... um, um, uh, shadow picture that we're living that's trying to point us to, I believe, his line of sight regarding what he's doing with his creation and his plan of redemption. Now, this is where it becomes very important. I've got here both men and women have Yah given design and spiritual line of sight, both men and women, not just men, not just women. So what does that mean? And you're going to start to see why the marriage covenant and the family nucleus is under such attack these days by the adversary. Because he wants this gone. Because there is a strength that is going to happen here. And I want to to share this a bit more. However, the men have been given a spiritual protector role. Okay, and this is important. There's a reason for this. And a woman's been given a spiritual nurture design. And there's a reason for this. If we disrespect this in this shadow picture, in this model, we're going to lose the line of sight of our Messiah. You see here the definition of a chad, okay, in the, in the Hebrew, this is, this is um, each, every, certain, only, once and for all, the one first. This, this Hebrew word, you know, our English transliteration, you'll often see one written in your English translation. Well, we think of one as a number, don't we? <laughs> you know, or something all in the same place. But a chad is, is, is a greater essence of something coming together with a certainty and once and for all. And so his truth, his standard of righteousness given to us was a chad. When he gave the covenant, when he gave his Torah, this is a chad. He's literally, it's certain. 
and it is one. And this is Yeshua is going to pray. And we'll look at this. The root of this, achad, is to go one way or the other. So you, we got this, you know, singular pronoun sort of a position here being given in the Hebrew. And it's very interesting. So something is being delivered. It's coming together once and for all. It is certain it's coming there. And now you're going to go one way or the other. <laughs> with this. And so we just look at this in a, in a very interesting way for the purpose of uh, us as a community to understand things. Of course, we see in better sheet in Genesis uh, 2 24 it says, therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. In other words, leaving and cleaving. I'm sorry, husbands, but you don't get to bring your mom and dad into your marriage. That's what it's actually saying. Doesn't mean you don't honor them, you don't give them respect, that you don't appreciate them, and suddenly they're, they're not your parents and all that kind of stuff. What it's saying is, son, you're going to marry the shadow picture of this all. And as a result, you're going to have to take up your spiritual headship. Now, many of us were not taught this correctly. And in fact, many in laws are, we got a lot of women and men in marriage is actually still married to their parents and they don't even know it. And it is very destructive. And so this brings a lot of things in here. What's it actually saying? It's not saying that they're not your mother and father anymore, you know, in the physical, it's not saying that you don't respect them. In fact, the covenant is to honor your mother and father. And what this is saying is you're now to hold fast to her. Because there is going to be a nature that comes into play here. They shall become one flesh. Echad. Like this is like, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Something is for the purpose of being certain for one to come together. And the root of this is you're going to go one way or the other. And in fact, this is warned about because there's going to be something in the woman's design that if the man doesn't take this spiritual headship up, she will. She'll do it. And so now that whole marriage covenant is going to go one way, not his way. Doesn't matter how good the intent is. And we can end up in a lot of problem. And this line of sight was to teach us something because it's a greater shadow picture of him and his people. It's also the shadow picture for us as a body in those ways and all these things. And no greater thing than actually the marriage covenant itself was to teach us this. I want to try to sort of explain it just to give it, you know, and I hate doing too many images around this because then we get caught up with the image, but it's more just to explain this. Messiah is our covering. He is the head of his people in his house. Nothing ever changes that. But we have been inserted into the time domain in a fallen state. And he's saying, this is what I want you to do. You're going to have two different roles. And these roles are deadly important for having a chad in your life that is of him. There is a very serious spiritual headship role, which I've just labored a little bit given to the husband. But there is a very spiritual helper role that is given to the wife. And these roles, when they come together in this great shadow picture, husbands, it's not controlship. It is the responsibility of spiritual headship. Women, it's not usurpship. This is actually to help and assist, you know, the idiot that you're linked with to actually get there. And so you, you, you're, you're literally, that's a harsh way to put it. But what I'm saying is we struggle. Sometimes we struggle in the helper role as women, and sometimes we struggle in the headship role as men. So he knew that we needed this because I'm going to tell you something here. This is, this is very important. The most fruit I have ever seen, ever seen in a marriage situation was where the spiritual achad line of sight was actually occurring. I promise you that I am a better man, husband, servant, everything you can think of because I have the line of sight of my wife spiritually. I want her input. I need her input. Because it forms part of the line of sight of Messiah. And so if I'm to ignore that with my spiritual headship responsibilities, I am ignoring Messiah. And, and, and as a woman and her role in this, if she 
takes away that nurture, that helper role and takes that away and ignores it. She's doing that to Messiah. So this is very sobering because the outcome of this, if both choose to be in repentance and to submit to his way and his design, we're going to end up with the spiritual line of sight in our lives and make much better decisions just practically as we navigate life's challenges. And every time I see this operating the way it should, a thriving a chad environment within the marriage covenant, never have I seen good men of Yah do this without a good woman of Yah with them. The power of a woman here is astounding. Where I've seen men really struggle is because they actually don't have that in their lives. And they're being usurped constantly or they're not being upheld. It's not being respected. They don't have, you know, and eventually they're giving up their spiritual headship role. The woman's wearing it all now. And then all of a sudden that breeds all sorts of bad fruit and so on and so on and so on. I don't know how you get the line of sight of Messiah unless both husband and wife become a chad in a marriage covenant situation. And this was the shadow picture he's trying to give. And Paul knew this of Messiah and his people. We're all the wife in this. <laughs> That's why it's serve one another. Thus fulfilling, you know, sharing one another's burdens. We have to learn as a body to be in the helper nurture role in the model he's given because Messiah is the covering, but as a part of that covering, he's given roles and responsibilities to both the male and the female. And if those are disrespected, this will not be good during the challenges of being in the physical fallen time domain. I don't want to serve at river Shabbat in Bible pathway adventures on eldership in the stables and anything else without the line of sight of my wife. I don't. Does that mean that I can't serve if I don't have it? No, I can. I can get other counsel and whatnot. In fact, you know, the people go into a situation where they lose a spouse or whatever it is. But what I'm saying is, is that the desire is a chad in nature. And if we don't respect that, if we don't care about that, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. And so as a result, we end up with all manner of things. Here's the interesting thing about the power of a woman. And we have, we have this, um, and I think it's an interesting insight as to perhaps what Messiah is looking for in the coming age. No greater influence I know of in the human form, no greater influence than a wife has on her husband. She has the ability to take him down or lift him up. And I think that that is teaching us something spiritually for the age to come. I think Messiah is selecting his bride very thoroughly. Because he's planning on listening to her as a part of this coming governance. And I think everything in his model is showing something. And this little shadow picture we have as a marriage covenant is seriously showing us all what's coming. So when we disrespect and we don't cherish our wives or we, we don't cherish and disrespect our husbands, we don't respect the roles that Yah's given us, everything else, we will see bad fruit. And unfortunately, many of us were not taught this. We've learned that. We've lived it in our own lives. And, you know, you get through it all and you realize, wow, he wasn't kidding with this whole marriage covenant thing. And why was it a marriage covenant thing? Well, actually, he's teaching us something. And this is what Paul got. Do you know that Paul got this? Paul knew the one mystery, the Achad mystery. He's saying this in 2 Timothy 2.12. This saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we also live with him. Now look at this, and a lot of people will miss this. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny, we will also deny us. Now this is interesting. He's gone right to the root of Achad. Achad to go one way or the other. Whoa. So the greatest thing he can give us, and Paul was getting this, he is the bridegroom. We are the woman. We can go one way or another with this, and he's given us every shadow picture to teach us. Boy, we were supposed to be raised that this covenant was going to teach us the weightiest of matters, and Paul knew this. And he spoke and taught the truth of Torah based on understanding this Achad mystery. 
And then he took it to the Ahad level. Unbelievable. The mastery of this servant is staggering to me. It is stunning beyond all comprehension how he could wield understandings and truths just speaking. And we've actually got people in the body that would dishonor this servitude almost 2,000 years later. And it's laughable. And as many who walk with me, it starts, uh, it really angers me because I'm just sitting there. How could you be just so disrespectful to somebody that commands an understanding of the application of Torah and the prophets at level you couldn't even possibly come near? You don't even know what you're reading anymore. Because you're so caught up arguing about how to pronounce the name of the father. I'm thinking that's your reason to run around and self-righteously judge people. Okay. So Matthew 19, 5, 7 is interesting here. So now we have Yeshua and he's in the garden and we're about to see the great covering of our bridegroom. And he's in the moment where this is going to take place. He's taking responsibility, accountability, and consequence at the highest levels now for us to become our cover. And he answered, have you not read he who created him from the beginning made them male and female? Wait a minute. He goes back to Genesis. He's going back to Bereshit 2.4. This is your king doing this. This is our Elohim doing this. And said, therefore, he shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now in the Greek, the heis there, that just means one. It's numerical. Okay, well, they'll come together, you know, as one. No, 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 no. <laughs> we just went through what that really meant. Now you know what Yeshua was truly saying. And Paul knew this. This is big. This isn't just a, a nice analogy. He is literally taking the design of how it's going to give us the line of sight of him. And he's related it right back at the garden. They show no longer what? Two, but one. They are going to come together in this. Do you know what it says, actually, that it is in, in, in his Torah? What? It is not good for, it's not good for man to be alone. What's the reason for that? Why is that? You get into the Hebrew of it and you're actually intimating, no, there's a design plan going on here by the Father. This is a line of sight that's going to come through in this incredible analogy. The context which this was being given in, by the way, was all about divorce and the hardness of heart and why Moshe allowed it. In other words, it was a heart issue. If you don't get this, if you don't understand this, your hardness of heart is going to take you and it's going to compromise your achad line of sight. Whoa. Don't think the context when you choose delivering this has no bearing. It has every bearing. It is about divorce. Now, this is from a believing context, of course. I know many of us, you know, we're not married in the faith of the faith and we end up in situations and all that. Don't get caught up in all that sort of stuff. Just understand what this was. This was a people relating and being given his truth and righteousness, the house of Israel. Okay, so nobody there is an atheist or has different views or anything else. They're all freaking out and they're getting the instructions of Yah. Okay, and so there's all these kinds of things. And understand that this was a matter of heart. You're going to go one way or the other. And the Apostle Paul knew this. Look at this. Now we're right there. This is the moment the bridegroom pays the price. He's going to buy his bride. And what does he say? All mine are yours and all yours are mine. I am glorified in them. Wow. Would he look at my life, your life? And go, I am glorified in them. <laughs> Do we meet that standard, really? And I am no longer in the world. He knows all that's going to happen. Now, this is interesting. But they still are. And I'm coming to you. Set apart, Father. Keep them in your name, your authority, your structure, not how to pronounce it phonetically according to you and your latest studies. 
Keep them in your authority, your achad. Look at this, which you have given me. Oh, you don't think this is achad? He's, he, he's not speaking Greek here. He's not speaking English. That they may be achad. Now that's in the Greek, that's heist. It just means one. What do you think he's actually saying? That they may be achad as we are achad. Wow. And you mean what underlies this whole thing is our ability to make the, the sovereign choice to go one way or the other. So with the women's discipleship and support, why, why do we value the woman's input? Why did Paul say single woman, you know, divorce woman, want to go to those elders who the, uh, the women elders in the body go to them because it matters. That part of the line of sight matters, but there's something interesting that comes with that which we all want and should want and the early Kahal had, and we should value and respect. When we seek, and this is why we go to such great lengths of the part of the support network and the, and the servant, the, the, the one of the qualifiers for eldership is to have one wife or one husband to be, to have your house in order. The reason for that, I'm going to suggest to you is a chad. It doesn't mean that just because you're not married, we're going to talk about this, that you can't have that line of sight. But who's inputting into your life? Do you know, you ever who's heard the term here, the blind leading the blind, both fall into the ditch? Oh, that's right. This kind of indicates that in scripture, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. What blind leading the blind? Think about that line of sight. Do you want to just get your counsel from one part of that line of sight? Is that, is that all you value? Like, do you even care? If you're truly seeking counsel in your life or an understanding you're seeking in a matter of truth, do you not want somewhere in here the input of the achad nature? Do you see my point? This is why eldership, which is generally where counsel is given, you want to have achad, particularly if you're single or divorced or widowed, not because you can't serve, not because you don't have worth, not because you can't be a part of, in fact, it's necessary in the whole body. The point is when you're seeking counsel, you want the chance at the achad line of sight and input in your life. And if you don't value that, we're not valuing his design. This is the point. It's not based on equality and equity and worth and all this, it's design role. And I tell you something, both are a must. If Yah says it is not good for man to be alone, I'm going to take his word on it. I trust him. It's not good. <laughs> we get into all sorts of things. You know, like, like just in the basics of a fallen physical shadow picture, it's just about staggering not only the power my wife has in the influence in my life, but the support and, and help to actually have me be able to even serve. You know, the way I do it. And so now could I do it without? Yes. Would I do it as well? No. I can tell you right now. That's me. I'm not saying someone else can do it, but I can tell you right now, I have come to value that line of sight to such a level that, you know, I seek it. Oh, but you know, Curtis, you have the spiritual headship role. Yeah. And as part of that spiritual headship role, I should darn well know that I need the value and insight of who y'all put in my life. <laughs> well, I better cherish that then. How about that? <laughs> However, she also better realize usurping the role that I have to fulfill is not a good idea for her. And it won't work out well. So what about the single divorced and the widow? You know, because some people can sit here and listen to this shadow picture and, you know, what it all been. And suddenly it's like, well, you know, what about me? Or do I have any worth in all that? Whew. You know, I'm going to make this very, very, very clear. Yah does not base his lover's worth on current relationship status in the fallen time domain. All right. Just number one, your worth and what you are in his part of the body is not based on that. What we're talking about is a shadow picture and design that we may have a framework that is getting this line of sight that doesn't take people 
suddenly may and puts them in a different worth status or love status. We just want to have the optimum input from the shadow picture into our lives. Well, as a single divorced or widowed person, you do too. Why? So you can serve others. So you can walk with others. You should value. You should go and get the Echad line of sight. You should want it. Some of the greatest service I know of within the body, and I mean this seriously, in many cases, much more than so-called married couples, it comes from those people who know that because their life journey and the experience, they might be divorced because of what they learned or overcome or the fires that had happened to them or widowed or still single or choose to be. And I'll tell you, the overcoming that comes with that, if they respect and want the line of the achat line of sight in their life and the experience and what they've gone through is necessary. What if you've never been divorced? How do you speak to somebody going through one? Like really at the most intimate levels, at the discipleship level, at the living water level. Is it possible you might want to go through somebody who's gone through that, overcome that, and be able to walk with that person? Be able Absolutely. This is not a joke. We're looking for counseling. We're looking for the holy men. We're looking for all of this kind of stuff. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about all the overcoming that exists in the body? And this is not based on our marital status. However, what the father has said is, and what you see modeled in the early Kahal is please do it a healthy way and value my shadow picture of the Akkad line of sight. Because I'll tell you, if you go to somebody, be it single, divorced, or widowed, that values the Akkad line of sight still and has that input into their lives, you're walking with a good brother, sister. I can tell you right now. You should, if you're seeking counsel, you should want that in your life. And if you're going to give counsel, you should want that in your life. Why? Because the Father wants it in our lives. It's not about worth and value and being able to serve or not serve. Repentance in his design is key, no matter our current position in this fallen state. It doesn't matter. Just because we're married doesn't suddenly mean we've got wise counsel. Some of the worst counsel I've ever seen has come from marriage situations because neither one of them respect the design. And like I say, some of the best service I've seen in the body has come from those who are not married because they do. How'd that happen? Wow. So please, don't think that I'm trying to teach that this shadow picture given to us in the fallen state in the marriage covenant, how it points to the weightiest of matters of how Messiah runs his house suddenly mean that there's no servitude and worth of those who aren't currently in a marriage covenant. It just means that we do it in a healthy way. And this is what Paul was saying. Okay, so if you're single, divorced, widow, whatever, go to one of the women's eldership that have this line of sight. Get that counsel for yourself so that you can give it to others or in your own life. Value it. It will produce good fruit. So as a part of this and what we're going to be doing in the community, yes, we have the men stables and the super stables and all that. Men have a very different design and we don't want to, you know, be trying to foster, you know, men's midrash, you know, sort of vomit tilling the soil type design that men can do, you know, boys can sit in a sandbox and throw sand at each other and still be friends afterwards. Okay. And we've been down this road in the earlier teachings. We have a way of being able to do things that is a part of our design. We don't want to put, um, the woman's uh, design and role into an unhealthy environment. And so what can often happen is, and this is why we don't use the stable language anymore when it comes to women's design and fellowship. At the same time, women want to get together and be a part of discipleship and fellowship and things like that. One of the things and ways we can be doing that is starting to be able to have these lounges or chin wags, you know, um, they go on in the body where we can connect people and whatnot. What we're trying to say is, is that if you're connecting with other women and you're doing that, we don't want to control the environment. You're going to, you're going to come together. You're going to walk your faith out. Be it single, widowed, divorced, married. What we are saying is husband, wife, male, female, divorced, singled, widowed, whatever it is, value the Achad line of sight. You value it. If you're listening to somebody who doesn't, I believe they're dishonoring and shaming their Messiah. You want people who get this to input into your life and you want to get it so you can input into others' lives. 
And I tell you something, the men I have seen that have not valued and cherished the line of sight of their wives are nothing but a disaster in the body. They are flying with one eye. And I don't particularly want to seek those men for counsel. And it's the same way. There are women who are usurping and completely disrespecting their husband. And they're flying with one eye as well. And it would be very wise that you're not getting counsel from a woman that's doing that. So this is, this is for men and women when it comes to the line of sight and for us to understand this. And if we're a community that values this, then we're going to value all aspects of the community, regardless of our relationship status, whatever that might be. And there's a worth and a value and a servitude that needs to happen within a whole body. And some of the greatest servitude and worth that we've got going is actually in people that aren't married. We just need to do it in a healthy way. And I hope we can understand this at that level so that we can be pleasing to Messiah. The time domain test, this temporary test. Look at this in John 17, 15 to 18. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. So Messiah's doing this. I didn't ask you to take them out of the world, but you, you keep them from the evil one. The evil that we're exposed to this knowledge of tree of good and evil. They are not of the world. Now, this is interesting. This maybe gives some insight that we really were inserted into the time to me. They are not of the world. This is, I am not of the world. You mean we're all getting put in, we're getting stuck in something. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This line of sight, this model that your king referenced, what we see in the Torah, this achad design for the shadow picture is his truth. And it's how we're going to respect it and learn it and try and understand it will matter whether we're married or single. As you sent me into the world, stuck me in the time domain, I have sent them. Whoa. You mean Messiah might have stuck us in this time domain? We call it conception. <laughs> These are very intimate moments being recorded here by Messiah. By the way, when these words are being. What is going on here? So kingdom eldership and support. Why do we do what we do in the donkey stables, the various ministries and leaders? Because we take this seriously. We don't want to fly blindly on our own. Be laws under ourselves. All these kinds of things. We actually are taking the structure seriously. And I'm about to finish as to why and how serious I believe this really all is. And what you're seeing in the donkey stable platform and whatnot with the ministries choosing to volunteer and work together and the eldership that has ensued as a result is a choice, a sovereign choice by those servant leaders because they're starting to get this and they're starting to value it. John saw in the Isle of in Revelation 4.4 4, and around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on those thrones were 24 elders. Whoa, whoa wait a minute. John seen a vision of, of the kingdom authority structure. And Yeshua himself has placed 24 elders around him. Do you think he has a knowledge issue? Do you think he needs them there so he can ask them some questions? I've, I've never understood this. Can you please tell me, Moshe? You really think that he needs them there for their knowledge? The creator of the universe is going to have an eldership. Let that sink in. It behooves us to ask why. I believe this could only be seen by John because you saw the literal fulfillment of first fruits. They were raised with Yeshua as a part of the literal fulfillment of the spring appointed times. And now John can see it on, I, on the island of Patmos and the visions that he hears and sees and can see, my goodness, the first fruits are sitting around him. The, well, first of the first fruits, actually, are actually sitting around him. Why? Because he's got amnesia and doesn't understand what's going on. And these guys need to remind him of his ways and his plan of redemption and everything else. You think they're going to tell him anything he doesn't know? Why are they there? What is this truly about? 
Later on in Revelation 4, 10, and the 24 elders fell down before him who is seated on the throne in the worship of him who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before his throne. They are in a completely submitted position to Messiah and one another. What we wear is not a result of our work. It is a result of your work, and we are not going to disgrace you. But coming into your presence in this eldership, claiming that it's all because of us and our whatever we did while we were in the fallen time domain. I believe you're looking at the literal fulfillment occurring of something, and he wanted us to be aware of this. Kingdom bridal governance. He takes it now in the Achad line of sight. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The revelation of Messiah I'm reading to you from. So this is his revelation. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Absolute ancient Hebrew marriage covenant speak. That's what the groom the bridegroom would come to the door. If she opened the door, that meant that she was interested. She would come in, they would sup together, and he would give the terms of the ketubah, the covenant. If she accepted it, they would share in a glass of wine. This is an ancient Hebraic practice. What you're seeing here is total bridal language being connected directly to kingdom governance. Look at this. The one who conquers or overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. I have also overcame and have sat down with my father on his throne. Whoa. This whole thing is a chad line of sight. And he's going to preserve it. He plans on keeping this whole shadow picture we're living, this whole thing that we're trying to do and try and work out and be healthy and have fellowship and all this guy. Whoa, it's all pointing to something. It's actually how he's going to run the final age. Look at this. Blessed and set apart is the one who shares in the first resurrection. This is the fulfillment of Yom Teruah. Over such a second death has no power. Look at this. But they will be priests of Elohim and of Messiah. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay. So we already know he's got the eldership there. We already know that he plans on having a bride to rule and reign with him. Full achad line of sight, except this is the real. This is what everything was pointing to. Remember his high priest prayer of achad? Remember what he said to the father just as he's about to make the purchase that we read earlier in this teaching? That they may be one? What do you think he's saying? Where's the one going to happen? He's speaking of the final age. He's literally doing it. It's going to have a literal fulfillment and everything we're experiencing is pointing to it. Kingdom rule and authority. On that day, the living waters in Zechariah 14, 18, waters, the living waters from this model, which will be in a chad line of sight, which at the heart of the discipleship that he patterned, shall flow out of Jerusalem. Half of them to the eastern sea and half to the western sea, and it shall continue even in the summer and winter, or in summer and winter. And Yah will be king over all the earth. And on that day, Yah will be the chad. And his name will be Echad. I'm not making this up. This is not just some, your life is not just some meaningful thing, meaningless thing. His design, everything that we see going on is all pointing. And Paul knew this. He spoke to it. I get it. You're putting in the whole Echad nature of raising your people. We better get this. And he got that when he got it from a position of being single. As best as we understand. Is it possible that his discipleship pattern was all linked and always has been 
to his coming kingdom and the final age of his great plan is all of why we bothered doing this, this Heart of Discipleship series. This is a hard line of sight to understand and respect the designs and the roles and what they're for. Is this all possible that it's a part of this great final age and, and great plan? Let's finish up here. Again, remember now the high priest prayer of Yeshua in Echad, that we may be one. And now his answer to me anyway makes sense. The disciples are asking, how shall we pray? And the first thing that comes out of his mouth, I believe is no coincidence. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And that kingdom is based on the whole shadow picture and everything we are seeing in the time domain that is all linked to an achad line of sight and the pattern of discipleship and what it provides all of us. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're in the shadow picture now of that will being done on earth or not. And we are going to go achad. We're going to go one way or the other with this. And my encouragement to all of us as we move forward as a community, please, please, it's not about how we see things, our plan, our current understandings, what we've been through, our bitterness, our hurt, our unforgiveness, our positions, everything. It's literally repent and understand that he's done everything for a reason. Let's understand it the best we can. Let's respect and value each other. Whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we're divorced, whether we're whatever, it doesn't matter. Let us actually understand what we're aiming for is his line of sight. And we want to have his line of sight. And we want to do this at the closer levels that he modeled and patterned so that we're not just living off the teachings. We're not just living off the gatherings. We're not just living off the songs. We're not just living. Let, let all of the good fruit be in those wider spaces of this tree of life because the living water of the Achad line of sight is coming to be. Amen. Let's finish there. Let's finish with the series. And let me, let me encourage you all as we move forward as a community. He's teaching us and we're going to get this and we're going to be there for one another. We're going to do this. Okay. And it doesn't matter what our positions are and where it is, but we're going to do it by respecting his design. That's all. And even though there is a world trying to teach another way, they've gone another way. They're a chad. They've turned away from this. Let us be a people that don't. Let us choose the chad line of sight. Let us choose that. Amen? Okay. Let's finish there and we'll come back for some Q&A uh, shortly. <laughs>